Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Joseph Daniel and I am the Director of Research at the Macmillan Centre in Birmingham, UK. I am going to talk about the survival of the 1996 series of resurfacings in Birmingham. This is one of the stages that preceded the development of the Birmingham hip resurfacings. But these patients have just completed 10 years following their resurfacing and we are some way through the process of completing their 10 year review. Metal metal bearings were not new, they fell out of favour when polyethylene containing devices became popular. During the 80s, it became apparent that wear-induced osteolysis is the cause of failure in conventional bearings, especially in large diameter bearings. By contrast, we had a series of patients with these large-headed metal metal bearings who showed little or no effects of wear over long-term follow-up. This success was seen with three different designs of metal metal THRs and all three were as cast cobalt chrome devices. Mr. McMahon was following up these patients at that time and it occurred to him that these bearings could hold the key to success with hip resurfacings. He therefore decided that the metallurgy of the resurfacing bearings under development would be identical to those metal metal THRs. Design and bench testing was started in 89 and the first series of metal metal resurfacings were introduced to clinical usage exactly 16 years ago with the understanding that all implants would be manufactured as as cast devices. In 1994, the HA coated uncemented cup and cemented femoral components were introduced as the McMinn device. However, sometime during 94 95, the devices were subjected to single heat treatments, and during 1996, double heat treatments were applied by the manufacturers. It is said that it's well nigh impossible to conduct a double blind study in orthopedics because neither the surgeon nor the patient can be blinded to the intervention. However, between 94 and 96, a very effective double blind study was imposed on us wherein neither the surgeon nor the patient knew what they were receiving. Cobalt chrome alloys owe their wear resistance to carbide precipitates. Post casting heat treatment result in dissipation of carbon into the metal matrix, resulting in reduced hardness of the alloy. Increased wear can then lead to osteolysis and aseptic loosening of these components with time. Here we present one case of progressive osteolysis occurring in well-fixed components in a 61-year female. At two years, there was osteolysis at the head-neck junction, but at four years follow-up, there was obvious osteolysis in the neck and around the socket. At revision, she was found to have metal debris in the capsule and synovium and around the femoral neck and behind the socket. This is another 52-year male patient with perfect radiographic appearances after the operation and at one year follow-up. At seven years, he came with increasing pain and progressively reduced walking ability. The seven-year radiograph did show a suggestion of socket and neck osteolysis, but this was not very clear on plain radiographs. A multi-slice CT scan, however, showed incontrovertible evidence of osteolysis above the superolateral corner of the socket, as seen in the image on the top, and also medial to it in the bottom left-hand side image. At revision, there was metal debris in the capsule and synovium and in the soft tissue adjacent to the femoral neck and behind the socket. Mr. McMinn has been highlighting the problems of the double heat treated components both through presentations and publications. When this report was submitted in 2002, there was a 6 to 7 percent failure rate in this series. Three years later, he published again, by which time the failure rate had risen to 11.6 percent with the 1996 series. This is a graph which is an excerpt from the publication mentioned above, showing survivorship with osteolysis and loosening as the endpoint. The red colored line relates to the 96 series. It is interesting to note that these osteolysis related failures did not manifest until three to four years after operation. This phenomenon has not been seen with the BHRs, the green line, even to this day when our early BHRs are approaching their 10-year follow-up. The incidence of failure with the single heat treated 1994 series is more acceptable than the double heat treated 1996 series. Now this cohort of 1996 resurfacing has reached their 10-year follow-up stage and are being systematically reviewed clinical radiologically. Seven patients died due to unrelated causes, 27 were revised of which one was for infection and the rest for osteolysis aseptic loosening, 78 patients attended a review clinic or sent questionnaires and radiographs. We are yet to review another 50 patients and this is ongoing at present. 
Compared to the 11.6% failure reported by us 1.5 years ago, the failure rate, I'm afraid, has further risen to 14% at 10 years now. Even amongst the survivors, nearly a third show radiographic adverse changes with or without clinical symptoms among those who have been reviewed. Here is a 35-year managing director of a furniture company. His two-month x-rays show perfect positioning of the components. He was fine till a couple of years ago but started developing twinges in the groin on and off. His 10-year radiographs show osteolysis at zone 1 and 3 of the socket and also in the neck and head neck junction. He knows that these changes are there and when his symptoms warrant, he will come in for a revision. This is a 38-year police officer. His two-month films show excellent positioning of the components and 10-year radiographs showing osteolysis, loosening and vertical migration of the cup. He too knows that these adverse changes are present and he knows that one day he will need a revision. This is a 59-year male, again with excellent positioning of his components at two months. He is functioning well except for some twinges in the groin, but osteolucent lines around the cup and cup loosening are present now. This is a 67-year male, perfectly happy with his hip for the past 10 years. He had some backache for a few weeks recently, but that has settled now. He too knows that there is osteolysis at zone 1 and 3 of the socket and also in the medial head neck junction. What do we learn from these failures? The retrieved components have been studied, their annual wear rates have been measured and the carbide volume fraction was studied with appropriate stains. And when they were plotted against each other, we found that there is an inverse linear relationship between the linear wear rate and the presence of carbide in the metal. The lower the carbide volume fraction in the alloy, the greater was the wear rate. The simple truth is that heat treatments increase bearing wear in the long term and lead to a higher failure rate. However, several resurfacing devices are still being produced with post-casting heat treatments in Europe and around the world. They cite hip simulator studies to support their continued usage of these bearings. Professor Unsworth from Durham University, who is himself one of the pioneers and leading authorities in hip simulator studies, succinctly explains the, this discrepancy between in vivo and in vitro wear studies. He highlights the fact that the loads to which hips are subjected to in real life may not be such predictable and well lubricated regimens as are programmed into the simulator. And that although the bearings in a hip simulator can be proven to enter into a fluid film lubrication regimen, this may not always be the case with the daily demands placed on hips in real life. That means in a hip simulator, a fluid film protects bearing wear. This does not happen in real life. And therefore, a high wear bearing in real life may actually not manifest high wear characteristics in a hip simulator. If you are in the UK sometime soon, one place you will want to visit is a monument called Another Place by the famous sculptor Anthony Gomley. It consists of 100 cast iron life-sized figures spreading out along the beach near Liverpool on the west coast of England. They were made from casts of the artist's own body, no late stage heat treatments. All of them look out to sea, staring at the horizon in silent expectation. The statues were created to be sent to New York, but the locals are so taken up with the unspoiled beauty of these rugged pieces that they will not let them go. Sometimes you may feel like these statues in the open, surrounded by the turbulent tides of argument and counter-argument and commercial hype. Sometimes I feel a bit like I'm out of my depths when I listen to metallurgy and microstructure from the learned engineers. How do these statues stand in the sand dunes, I ask? They tell us that they rest on a three-meter foundation. The metal-metal bearings on which the BHR is developed is based on the foundation of the as-cast cobalt chrome bearings used for the past four decades. As you embark on this journey of hip resurfacing and look to the future, the simple question is, do we learn from the lessons of the past, the good, the bad and the ugly? Or shall we ignore them? The choice is yours. Thank you very much.